Recently the company Neuralink presented an update on its progress, led by founder Elon Musk. He never said anything about ALS, but I think that the Neuralink brain machine interface is one of the most exciting developments for people with ALS. Let me show you why. Hi. I'm Brad. I have ALS. This is ALS Tech, and my biggest frustration with ALS is the inability to use technology. In this clipped video from the Neuralink presentation, I will show you why Neuralink is an exciting solution for people with ALS. To help me build this channel and the YouTube algorithm, please like this video and subscribe for more videos about using technology to live better with ALS. And please comment below to tell me what you think or ask any questions. Because I can't talk, the Proloquo Fortex app is talking for me. That is the biggest reason why I am excited for Neuralink, because my device is my only connection to the world. All right, welcome to the Neuralink product demo. I'm really excited to show you what we've got. I think it's going to blow your mind. Uh, our goal is to solve important spine and brain problems with a seamlessly, seamlessly implant, implanted device. So you want to have a device that you can basically uh, put in your head um, and feel and look totally normal, uh, but it solves uh, some, some important problem um, in your brain or spine. And the reality is that almost everyone uh, over time will develop brain and spine problems. Uh, these range from uh, minor to very severe, but if you live long enough, you, you, everyone's going to basically have some kind of um, neurological disorder. And these range, from, you know, um, the neurons are like wiring, um, and you kind of need an electronic thing to solve an electronic problem. So the current medical research uh, has shown that you can uh, read neurons in a human's brain. So there's something called the Utah array, which has about 100 channels per array. Uh, but it's, it's like, kind of like a, it's a bed of rigid spikes that's literally inserted with an air hammer. Uh, so, you know, that's slightly discomforting, I think. Um, so we want to radically improve this by multiple orders of magnitude, improve it by a factor of 100 then 1,000, then 10,000. Um, we've simplified this to simply something that is uh, about the size of a large coin. Um, and it, it goes uh, in your skull, replaces a piece of skull, um, and the wires uh, uh, then, then connect uh, within a few centimeters or about an inch away from the device. Um, and this is sort of what it looks like. This is our little device. Uh, it does, that, that thing at the bottom is just to hold the threads in place because they're just like little fine wire, wires. In, in a lot of ways, it's kind of like a Fitbit in your skull with tiny wires. Yeah, so our, our current prototype, version 0 0.9, has about 1,000 channels. Uh, so that's you know, about 100 times better than the, the next best um, uh, consumer device that's available. And it's a 23 millimeters by 8 millimeters. It actually uh, fits quite nicely in your skull because your, your skull is about 10 millimeters thick. So uh, it fits, it's, it goes flush with your skull, it's invisible, and all you can see afterwards is that there's a tiny scar. And if it's under your hair, you can't see it at all. In fact, I could have a neural link right now and you wouldn't know. Maybe I do. Um, it's charged in the same way that you, char you charge a smartwatch or a phone. Um, and so you can use it all day, uh, charge it at night, and have full functionality. So in terms of getting a link, like I said, it's essentially uh, you open a piece of skull, um, you remove uh, about a coin-sized piece of skull, uh, and then the robot inserts the electrodes. Uh, we'll talk more about that later. Uh, then the device replaces the portion of skull that was removed, and we, we basically close that up with actually a super glue, which is how a lot of wounds are closed. And, uh, and then you can just walk around right, after, right afterwards. It's pretty cool. Um, so this, this shows you um, at a sort of close-up view, uh, which I think is actually not too gruesome, uh, of the electrodes being inserted in the brain. And if you look closely, you'll see that um, that's a, it's a little counterintuitive that uh, if the electrodes are inserted very carefully, that there is no bleeding. Um, and so the, uh, if you have very tiny electrodes and 
if they're inserted very carefully so that the robot actually images the brain and makes sure to avoid any veins or arteries so that the electrodes can be inserted um, with no noticeable damage. Does it actually work? And uh, what I'm excited to show you, um, I'll quote like the, the, the three little pigs demo. Um, all right. As you can see, Gertrude is healthy and happy. Um, you can just, if you look closely, you can just barely see the scar where the implant was put in. Um, and, sorry. Um, and now let's, uh, let's take a look at the, the real-time data that's being transmitted uh, from Gertrude's Neuralink implant. So. So what you're seeing there are all 1,024 channels, and each of those dots is a spike. And the, this neural link is implanted in the region of the brain that uh, where, where the, the snout, <laughs> snout is located, which is actually quite a large part of a Briggs brain. And so when, when you touch Gertrude's snout, uh, you, can, you can see that there's a whole bunch more neurons that fire. And, you, and that sound you hear is a, a collection of neuron sp neural spikes. So every time that the snout is touched, it, the, it, the neural link device uh, in her head is transmitting the data uh, that she is sensing, and we're seeing it on the screen. And uh, she's had the implant for two months. So this is a healthy and happy pig with an implant that is two, month old, two months old and working well. Yeah. Fortunately, um People think of spikes or action potentials as the electrical events that happen uh, in neurons and as the primary form of communication between neurons. Um, and so this is a uh, hysteresis event where you have currents that flow and generate this, uh, you can think of it as being a digital signal, uh, a one or a zero that's being sent in time um, where neurons will send that signal to uh, often thousands of, of recipient neurons. Probably see that. Um, as I was saying, uh, each of those dots represents a neural spike, and the, um, the, the blue chart at the bottom is showing an accumulation of neural spikes in that region. So, uh, in, in, in terms of additional uh, brain reading activity, uh, when we have, um, say, um, one of our pigs on a treadmill, <laughs> pig on a treadmill, <laughs> um, it's a funny, funny concept, really. Um, and we uh, take the, the readings from the neurons and we try to predict the posi position of the joints. Um, and so we, say we have the predicted position of the joints and then we, we measure the actual position of the joints. You can see that they're almost exactly aligned. So we're able with um, a wireless neural, imp neural implant to actually predict the position of, of all of the limbs uh, in the pig's body uh, with, with very high accuracy. So like I said, for the initial device, it's read write in every channel uh, with about 1,024 channels, all day battery life, uh, recharges overnight, uh, has quite a long uh, range. So you can, you can, you can have uh, the range, uh, the range being to your phone, I should say. That's um, kind of an important thing. This would connect to uh, your phone. Um, and, and actually, the, so the, the application uh, would be on your phone. And, the, and it would be communicating by, by essentially Bluetooth low energy to the device in your head. Um, that's why I say it, in a lot of ways it is like a Fitbit in your skull with tiny wires. And we're making good progress towards clinical studies. Um, I'm excited to announce that we received a, a breakthrough device designation from the FDA in July, uh, thanks to the hard work of the Neuralink team. So I want to be clear, we're working closely with the FDA um, and we'll, um, we'll be extremely rigorous. In fact, we'll. Um, we will significantly, significantly exceed the minimum FDA guidelines for uh, safety. We will make this uh, as safe as possible. So we're working on making the device as small as possible, of course, uh, with the robot taking more and more of the responsibility away from error-prone human surgeons. Uh, we're hoping to make the process faster and safer. Hi, my name is Joey O'Doherty. I'm a neuroscientist and neuroengineer working on decoding from the brain. Um, so there's some low-hanging fruit that I think can really be impactful to help many people's lives, and that's restoring movement and communication in, for example, a spinal cord injured patient. Um, and there's a lot of antecedents in the academic world where there have been very nice demonstrations of doing this. 
and we think we can take our technology and really bring that uh, to the home, something people can take home with them and improve their lives. What kinds, of, what kinds of things can you solve on the cortical surface versus when you go deeper? Sure. So um, a lot of the low-level processing happens in the cortex um, in terms of um, motor intentions, sensory information that comes directly in. Um, so your hearing, your auditory percepts, your visual processing, a lot of that happens in the cortex. I mean, you could, you could solve blindness. Blindness, yep. um, you could solve paralysis, you can solve hearing. You can solve a lot if, if, just by interfacing with the cortex. What is the most challenging problem that must be solved in order to meet Neuralink's ultimate goal? Well, I, I think uh, one of the hardest problems is kind of, I'd say, material science and uh, the, especially the uh, installation of the electrodes, and, uh, making sure that the, the threads, though the electrodes, can uh, last for decades uh, in the brain. Uh, which is a, a tricky thing because uh, it's a it's a very corrosive environment, um, and uh, you, you're you're in a, in a dichotomy where you you want to read and you you want to sense electrical signals and you want to generate electrical signals, um, and uh, but you don't want to corrode the electrodes over time. So you need to have an insulating layer that is very robust but also very very thin. Uh, <laughs> Uh, how thin. Uh, so one strand of your hair is about 100 microns in diameter. Uh, we can think about dividing that into 20. So, uh, you know, our, 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 our one of the thickness that we recognize is about 5 microns. Um, and we have this possibility to go even thinner uh, uh, in the nearest future. Yeah, uh, yeah we, th we think we can probably go sub-micron in, in thickness. Uh, but it, obviously, as the thinner, you, the thinner you make the wire, the harder it is to sense the signal and to do stimulation because uh, there's less cross-sectional area for the current to traverse. Yeah, so the current version of the implant that we have is using Bluetooth low energy radio. So um, similar to any Bluetooth devices that are out there, you know, they, they are able to coexist with other devices that are using and sharing our same spectrum in 2.4 gigahertz. Um, obviously, as you imagine, you know, when you go to concerts or there's just a lot of people, um, the signal quality does degrade because it is a pretty congested spectrum. So we are actually working on some new versions of the radio that are operating at different frequencies to be able to also send out a lot more data and have it be scalable to, you know, millions of electrodes. Um, and then also in terms of sort of electromagnetic compatibility and interferences, um, Obviously, it's very important for us to coexist with other systems and just disturbances out there. So um, there are also well-documented guidelines from FDA that we'll be following and doing a lot of testing for. So our, our first clinical trial is aimed at uh, people with paraplegia or, or tetraplegia, uh, so cervical spinal cord injury. We're going to enroll, uh, we plan to enroll a small number of patients uh, to make sure the device is safe and that it works in that case. Uh, yeah, so actually just to elaborate on that, um, if somebody is um, like a severe spinal cord injury, uh, you know, to the degree that they, they even, they have um, very limited control even uh, over their facial muscles, uh, then uh, but, but with, with this implant, you can actually uh, think, just, just by thinking, you can output um, words and you can, you can type and you can control a computer, control a phone. and uh, which is pretty, pretty wild, and we'll be able to save and re replay memories. Um, I mean, this is obviously sounding increasingly like a Black Mirror episode, um, but, uh, well, they, I guess they're pretty good at predicting. Um, but yeah, essentially, if, if you have a whole brain interface, everything that's encoded in memory, you could, uh, you could upload. You could basically store your memories um, as a backup and restore the memories. Um, and ultimately, you could potentially download them into a new body or into a robot body. The future is going to be weird. <laughs> I think one of the reasons that consciousness is so hard is because, like anything in physics, you're looking at a mapping from X to Y, where X is the neuronal correlate, it's the thing that's happening then physically, and then Y is this phenomenal state. And historically, we've been unable to observe the neuronal correlates very well, and unless it's in you, we've been unable to observe the phenomenal state. So as soon as you were able to neuroscientists are able to personally get these tools where they can see the correlates and they can have the experience, I think the hard problem will vanish very quickly. So for, first and foremost, uh, privacy and security are top priorities at Neuralink. 
um, especially given the sensitivity of the data that we're collecting. And one of the things that we're ensuring is to make sure that a lot of the interactions with the brain data is going to be encrypted and authenticated properly. One of the things that's allowed us to make such fast progress in the last few months is the use of pigs as, as a model. And we started out using choosing pigs because of very similar anatomy of their skull to humans, same thickness and similar kind of uh, membrane, dural membrane. But then as time went on, we realized that pigs are actually uh, have amazing other properties. You can train them to walk on treadmills. You can uh, um, train them to do all kinds of tricks. And, and also that they have this large representation of the snout in the cortex, which you can very easily stimulate. So uh, the question would be, why are we using pigs? And I think um, we've even surprised ourselves at how, how useful they are as a model in this respect. And another important point is that it's very easy to keep pigs happy. Um, they, they have very low uh, uh, needs, and so uh, we can build an environment in which uh, they have a, amazingly good welfare. And uh, th they're, also, they're quite robust creatures, like little tanks. Um, and, and then I think one of the questions was, like, what if, like is, is the device uh, itself robust? And it's like, well, you know, pigs, they bustle around quite a lot, and they, they bump into things, and they, 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 they headbutt each other at times, and um, they're, they're pretty animated. So if the device is lasting in the pig, um, as it lasted uh, there for two months, uh, and still going strong, um, then that's a good sign that the device is uh, robust for people. <laughs> yeah, I, I've actually been excited from the beginning sort of about the like side benefit of these devices. I sort of see them as uh, essentially like an oscilloscope to a uh, printed circuit board is our device to the brain, where just by virtue of having this in there and uh, being able to see what's actually going on, you'll end up learning a ton about how the brain works. Um, and so sort of augmenting people, but also just using that to learn a lot more about like neurological diseases is really exciting to me. I think we have an incredible opportunity to limit human suffering to a tiny fraction of what it is today uh, in all kinds of different avenues. Pain uh, being the essence of suffering, we might be able to control that finally. Uh, and so many other diseases, so much other um, suffering in the world, I think the Neuralink device could help a lot with. I'm really excited about uh, the opportunity to help people overcome uh, challenges that they face through life circumstances, bad luck, through no fault of their own, spinal cord injury, brain disease, some devastating things that completely change your life. Hopefully we can uh, help them get some function back. Isn't that amazing? I dream of being able to control my device with my mind. It would allow me to have a real conversation with my wife and kids. My mind is still running full speed ahead, but I can only communicate with my eyes at one second per letter. If the first round of human trials is focusing on quadriplegics, I want to qualify. I am ready to go. If you know someone at Neuralink, please let me know. This is ALS Tech. Thank you for watching.